Okay, uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, uh, glad to have you all back uh, in this class on the local church. So we'll pray and uh, we'll begin. I would like to request someone to please lead in prayer, please. Anyone who is able to? Okay. I'll pray. Yes, yes, Tara, please. Thank you. Father, thank you for this um, class that you've blessed us with as we come together and study your word. Let it be your wisdom that guides us. Father, we pray that uh, uh, let it be your spirit that helps us uh, deeply interpret uh, the word that we are reading and uh, help us to draw closer to you, to understand more of you, Lord. We pray for your presence uh, as we... Uh, uh, read through and understand things. Give us an open heart uh, to truly understand and draw each one of us closer to your nature, Lord. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Tarun. Uh, yes. So we will, uh, uh, you know, continue looking at some of the things that we have um, seen earlier. So we had spent some time on understanding the the practice of the ordinances in the in the church. Okay, so we uh, studied about the Lord's table. We studied about baptism. Uh, and now we are going to move on to other things here. So church discipline, resolving conflicts. Um, this is where we were, and we said that you know, uh, depending on uh, certain situations. Uh, we we will have to look at what God's word instructs us and then, you know, accordingly, whether it is being correction um, or whether it is uh, trying to restore a fallen minister, we go by what, uh, you know, God's word prescribes. And then we also said that the response of uh, individuals is, uh, it can be varied. You know, some can respond positively, whereas others may not necessarily uh, like the instructions that are being given to them so uh, you know one one needs to have god's wisdom to manage uh, every situation so that's what we said uh, and uh, uh, i i think uh, we uh, i'm not uh, able to recall if we have uh, like you know covered everything uh, but the last section here also says that if we um, do not get a uh, a certain response that we were looking for uh, that we must not take things personally okay? we mustn't uh, there, there is a part with that we have to play but beyond that you know when it comes to correcting uh, people uh, resolving conflicts don't take matters personally uh, don't take offense uh, and also allow uh, uh, allow people time uh, and if at all they make a decision to move uh, forward and they don't no longer want to be a part of the ministry that uh, you know you you uh, are running then that's fine you know we let them go uh, so that they are able to continue to grow in god but maybe in a different environment uh, so these are all the aspects that we had looked at and then we uh, uh, you know said that we will briefly look at the order in church gatherings. Okay, so uh, this chapter is fairly um, uh, small here. Uh, and over here, we see that you know, everything needs to be done in an orderly manner. We've uh, recently discussed about the Lord's table and we saw how you know Paul wanted people uh, not to come and get drunk and dishonor the Lord's table. Instead, you know, he instructed them and told them that you, know, you uh, if if at all you know there is a there's a possibility of of uh, getting drunk in the church gathering you know to avoid that why don't you have your meal at home and then you come here just to celebrate the lord's table so there are instructions that he uh, gave uh, in the matter of the lord's table uh, and we also see you know paul uh, saying this in first corinthians 14 and verse 33 he says that god is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So uh, God's intention is peace you know, in uh, the way he ministers to our hearts. Okay, Charles, I am on uh, page number 
134. Okay, so that's where I'm at. Yeah, God's intention is for uh, there to be peace and that we order uh, and we apply this to everything you know, that concerns uh, our coming together, uh, not just the uh, just the Sunday services, but in everything. And uh, Paul also writes, you know, First Corinthians fourteen forty, where he says that let everything be done decently and in order. So that's what we are called to. Uh, we must ensure that we have good planning, good coordination, uh, and uh, you know, depending on uh, what resources are available to us, you know, we have to manage that very well. So I think very briefly we said that uh, uh, when we organize a gathering, then we have to ensure that the timing is, is planned correctly. Uh, so if we have, uh, let's say, about two hours for a service, then uh, we must make sure that the main aspects of the service, which would be the sharing of the word, worship, you know, those, those um, uh, things take precedence over other, other things you know, that, can be, that can be done in a quicker way. So stuff like announcements, uh, you know, uh, other things uh, like, if you if you have a really tight program and many things are happening then you know how are you going to uh, how are you going to coordinate and plan and line people up instruct them you know to come quickly to the to the uh, stage and you know finish their part so that we are making more time for the main aspects of the worship so that the people who come in right to worship they uh, truly have the opportunity to do that and to uh, go back strengthened in their spirit now use of tongues in corporate gatherings this uh, we haven't done in detail um, so we we can look at this so basically we get our instructions for the use of spiritual gifts from the passage 1 corinthians 14 where uh, you know paul not just about tongues but he has instructions about prophecy um and uh, i mean mainly these two uh, and the order in which people must actually go about uh, you know ministering these spiritual gifts so here we find that uh, paul instructs when it comes to speaking in tongues he instructs that we are okay or permitted to speak in an unknown tongue in a congregation setting provided there is interpretation so he says as long as there is interpretation of the message one is allowed to give the message uh, uh, but if there is no interpretation then you know he instructs and he says uh, keep silent so i won't be going through the scriptures but the scripture numbers are given here so that is first Corinthians 14 verses 16 to 19 and then again you know 27 32 so uh the reason why uh, paul says this is because uh tongues primarily is um the the main form of tongues which we all are familiar with you know, that is for personal edification so when Paul talks about him speaking in tongues, you know, in the same passage, 1 Corinthians 14, he says that I speak in tongues much more than all of you. So that tongues is the personal edification tongues. But when it comes to ministering in the church gathering or ministering in a setting when there are other believers, you know, he insists that there be interpretation. So this form of tongues is a tongues which is a message to the body and a, a, a message to the body will be of no use if people are not able to understand it and they are not able to uh, receive it and that is the reason a message should have interpretation so when it comes to the use of uh, tongues in a in a uh, in a gathering uh, it is best that a message has an interpretation and paul writes he says if you don't have an interpretation then it is better for you to be silent so it's all about edifying the church body okay so that is how tongues is supposed to be used in the corporate gatherings okay uh, now we just want to add here that while we are so uh, keen on maintaining order in our gatherings because 
scriptures tell us that paul wrote uh, 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 that to the local churches but at the same time you know we do understand that the work of the spirit right sometimes is such that though we have a structure though we have a plan okay the holy spirit might lead in a slightly different manner of course in conformity to the word of god uh, because the spirit and the word agree in 1 john 5 7 so the holy spirit is not going to cause something to happen uh, which uh, you know the father or the son or the word of god disagrees with but you know, we can uh, find find that the holy spirit moves in a slightly different way than what we had originally planned out you know for that service or for that gathering so you now we must be open to god's working amidst us you know some 115 and verse 3 it says but our god is in heaven he does whatever he pleases so you know god has his own way of doing things so uh, at this point you know i just want to say that uh, like example if we have planned our church service thoroughly and uh, uh, you know the coordination is happening uh, in an excellent way and you know everything is uh, everything is sort of set okay it could so happen that in one church service you know um, your message is prepared the uh, the pastor or the preacher is ready to deliver the sermon but what if the holy spirit just leads us into extended times of worship okay uh, and uh, you just sense that anointing for uh, god's presence to minister to the hearts of the people you know uh, prophetic words are coming through as the worship team is leading and so you just sense that this is the direction in which the holy spirit would want us to go you know this particular sunday so it is possible that you know uh, that service uh ends up being a completely like a like a worship of adoration uh, like a service of adoration and singing you no know, songs of worship unto the lord whoever is is uh, overseeing that particular service must be open and must be sensitive to the leading of the holy spirit so it's it's a very um, find balance you know we want to maintain order but at the same time there is a way in which the holy spirit leads now what if in that service you know god wants to focus in on the baptism in the holy spirit what if god wants to focus in on healings okay and uh, some form of restoration in the lives of people in in families in relationships so uh, uh, though we may have planned that we are going to spend um, uh, you know 50 minutes sermon and wrapping up the sermon and all of that we just sense that hey god wants to move us in that direction so maybe we want to wrap up the sermon in 30 minutes and then spend additional time on uh, you know the the ministry uh, part of the service so basically it's about being sensitive though we have a set format and a structure we must uh, uh, be sensitive to the leading of the holy spirit uh, and then again you know uh, in uh, church gatherings it is possible that uh, we find fleshly manifestations okay what are fleshly manifestations uh, sometimes you know when we are very familiar with church and the church culture uh, somewhere in our in our uh, mind somewhere in our uh, uh, you know natural uh, self certain things get programmed you know the the way we uh, uh, we Uh, let's say you know you you might find people uh, people behaving as if they're filled with the holy spirit and shaking and all of that but that may not necessarily be the outpouring of the holy spirit right because sometimes we are we get so familiar that subconsciously we tend to uh, we tend to just do things that we have seen earlier or uh, you know you all kinds of other manifestations maybe you know people uh, out of their fleshly zeal or they be filled with the holy spirit there are there are people crying or uh, that but it may it may not be 
the the holy spirit manifesting right so sometimes these kind of things happen and uh, it's hard to tell even you know whether it's the holy spirit at work or you know what's happening are people manifesting um, you know some sort of uh, demon spirits but whatever you know we we observe around us we can bring order okay uh, in those in those situations as well and if we do recognize you know that something is a manifestation of the flesh then we could address that in a loving manner with the with uh, the people concerned but the ultimate fruit you know sometimes when we have these manifestations and we are wondering you know whether it is from god or whether it is uh, you know something that that people uh, are are uh, creating the best thing to do is to see the fruit Okay, the fruit will tell us whether a certain move of God or a certain uh, manifestation was from God or not. Because at the time when the fleshly manifestation is taking place, it's really hard to tell. Uh, sometimes, you know, whether it's the Holy Spirit or uh, something else is going on. So uh, we who are uh, open. to the working of god's spirit must also uh, be aware that there can be fleshly manifestations which are an imitation of the work of the spirit and sometimes people try to get into these things okay uh, but i guess it just comes with the the territory if we are open to the prophetic if we are open to the work of the holy spirit that there will naturally you know be some uh, imitations uh, but one must be discerning in the spirit and guide the service accordingly okay and uh, uh, address it in the uh, right manner so this is a little bit about having order uh, in church having uh, maintaining that decency and uh, uh, you know uh, order that paul was talking about so we can move on to the next uh, section here which is about women in ministry i think we've already discussed a little bit in kingdom uh, builders but this will also add to uh, whatever we've learned earlier so any any thoughts any comments questions about order in church gatherings some key aspects were discussed but i'm sure you know, there are a lot of other things also which can be talked and the Uh, order in church gatherings so yeah okay any questions um yes sir yes yes um pastor <clears throat> in, in, um i maybe just kind of to discuss Uh, where where do you kind of draw the line god is god is a god of order i agree very well but i i find that sometimes we could be so structured that we 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 might just think um we might just forget the holy spirit you know uh, mm-hmm. where where do we where do we draw the line whereby uh we can still be flexible you know and at the same time everything is done in order you know um mm-hmm. because it, it, sometimes we can just have a program and even for a year you know you keep repeating the same thing every time and you think oh you're just being orderly but uh, that's not what the spirit of god wants to do so i'm i'm just kind of bringing this up you know uh, it's actually been on my mind because sometimes we can kind of want to just repeat the same thing year in year out monting monting and i think sometimes we could be just too structured and the holy spirit is just waiting on us to be sensitive to him to know okay th- you could do it this way this is what i want to do, i want to accomplish you know in the church in your group and all that so just maybe to buttress mm-hmm. uh, throw more light you know on that mm-hmm. yeah sure sure see uh yeah so i uh, say so what i would say for this is see it's it's about being sensitive throughout and that's what i believe um so even while we are planning uh let's say a, a format a service format or we're heading a ministry and we are planning okay what are all the the activities or the programs 
uh, that we need to have for this ministry. Uh, be sensitive throughout. Okay, uh, and we see that example, you know, in the life of uh, uh, Apostle Paul. He's a great example. You know, he was led by the Spirit. Mm, there are places where he wanted to go, but the Spirit didn't allow him to go. There are places from where he wanted to uh, quit, but the Spirit didn't allow him to quit. So he was sensitive, and even when he was moving towards Jerusalem. um uh, you know holy spirit gave him the impression that it's going to be difficult for you they're going to bind you there and yet you know he knew this is in god's plan for me so yeah i'm going i'm going in that direction even though it's going to be hard so the point is be sensitive always even when we are planning program so once we have planned the program and you know again the question how can we plan the program what if the holy spirit leads us in a different way uh you know during the program well uh, i i think we touched on the scripture earlier say this is isaiah 46 and verse 10 where uh, it says that god knows the end from the beginning so he knows if he's going to move by the spirit in a different way um uh, he he is able to give me an impression of that you know well ahead in time so that i can be prepared so uh, i'm not saying that you know we would know every move that god is going to make no not at all you know uh, even the people in the upper room uh, it says and suddenly they knew there is going to be an outpouring of the spirit they didn't know when they didn't know what fashion or form okay they just knew joel's prophecy but you know god gave peter the discernment because it says dreams and visions but here are people talking in tongues and still peter looks at it and he says this is that okay so it's all about you know being so so united with the spirit uh, throughout and we do our part to discern the leading of the spirit to plan the structure even uh, and then even though we plan it by being sensitive to the holy spirit let's say yeah we have heard from god and we plan the structure but one sunday service you know as i as i shared maybe even the worship team is not able to worship everyone's just on their knees everyone's just you know adoring god and you see just spending time you know praying and crying and whatever we allow that to happen okay but uh, the point is predominantly when we when we plan something led by the spirit it kind of remains and then there are always exceptions you know there's always the fine tuning that happens here and there and if we are really depending on the spirit you know throughout god is god is uh, you know we are we are okay for god to say hey pack this up so if we have an impression where god says i really don't want you to do this you know close this activity we are okay to course correct so you wrap it up you maybe introduce something else or you don't introduce anything at all you know so uh, the thing is uh, say even though you asked about being sensitive in a structured format and saying throughout the planning if we are sensitive it really helps uh, at that way we can have the norm and then yes you know some some uh, portions here and there the exception will happen because the spirit will lead very differently but otherwise i think we kind of can maintain that norm um uh, you know for a while so i hope i'm making sense thank you yeah. pastor thank you yeah sure sure yes thank you good question there yeah uh, anything else any other comments yeah so uh, you know it's it's a it's a beautiful balance you, we can be structured and at the same time we can be very spirit led so if we can maintain that uh, i think Yeah, that that is very helpful and especially um uh, in in things that involve you know more people and large numbers so just imagine you know for a church service let's say um, uh, 5000 people are showing up if there's no order we don't know what time it's starting we don't know what time it's ending we don't know what's going to happen we you know it's like 
the teams don't know nobody knows it's very difficult it it becomes very difficult for everybody involved whether it is the organizing team or the the um, uh, people who are attending but uh, if uh, primarily there is one one uh, some sort of a an order that we subscribe to it's helpful yes of course there will be sometimes where we go over time or we finish before that things are different but those would be exceptions yeah okay all right so that's about uh, order if there are no more questions yes. yeah i think there are no questions so okay let's move on this is uh, uh, chapter 22 page 137 where we are going to talk about women in ministry okay since we are talking about the local church so there's always a question of whether women can uh, be part of the ministry in the local church at various capacities this could be at um, uh, you know just serving volunteers uh, or somebody who is heading up leading a ministry is that possible is that scriptural uh, so we'll we'll spend some time looking at it so when we consider women in uh, the, the word of god even from the old testament you know we find that there were women who were ministering unto the lord who were called to serve the people so there are some examples here miriam uh, you know miriam is called the prophetess she was the sister of aaron and we know how she danced with a timbrel in her hands so uh, you know she was uh, uh, very much in the forefront of of things in the old testament then of course there is deborah okay? and deborah um, you cannot say that uh, she was a leader okay in her own right and she was leading uh, even uh, the the generals at that time the uh, uh, you know the army general uh, uh, at that time so she was a woman with authority and uh, gifted with leadership so deborah is somebody that we see in scripture you now halda uh, is the wife of uh, azea she's also uh, called a oh sorry um, halda here is a prophetess yeah correct uh, and then you know we we see that uh, as the wife of isaiah uh, she doesn't really um, we don't see too much of ministry uh, regarding her but then we know that there was some role that she had and uh, it was a it was a ministry role okay then esther now esther is also a leader uh, we see her becoming a sort of a deliverer okay deliverer for an entire nation then uh, in the new testament we we can um, look at the life of anna now anna's ministry is different we may not we may not see her um, you know serving out there in the in the local church but hers was more of an intercession you know fasting sort of a ministry nonetheless you know we we've studied about this when we studied about prayer and intercession but that is also ministry okay? and god uh, places a high value on that so anna uh, was engaged in ministry she's also um, called as a prophetess okay then philip's daughters Philip's daughters. He had four virgin daughters, and the scriptures tell us that they prophesied. So they were moving in the New Testament. Women were were moving in the gifts of the Spirit. So that much we can um, agree on. So now coming to other questions here, uh, <coughs> can a woman be a minister? Minister is service. Okay, so service in the house of God is it possible for a, a woman to be serving God? so as we look at uh, you know passages on men and women uh, it's uh, uh, very clear that the god the grace of god is given equally to a man and woman so galatians 3 verse 28 could somebody please read it uh, these verses are in our notes i'm on page 138 so galatians 3 28 one person can read first peter 3 7 another person can read please Yeah, you. 
Shall I read, ma'am? Yeah, yes, yes, Ami, please. Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's uh, look at the other verse also. Anyone else ready to read it? <clears throat> 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands oh. likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, uh, these passages are quite self-explanatory. It just says, you know, there's equality, uh, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So as we stand uh, before God uh, as the recipients of his work of salvation, we're all the same. We're all on level ground. Okay. So that is a clear cut. Even here in First Peter 3, 7, Mm, uh, Peter writes, as being heirs together of the grace of life. So God does not, um, he, uh, you know, doesn't give a larger measure to one gender as compared to the other gender. There's equal grace given to both man and woman. So that is clear before the eyes of God when it comes to salvation and the grace of God, we are all the same. So now let's continue to uh, uh, look at you know, some of those, those passages which are unclear. So we're talking about ministry. Can women be ministers of God? Uh, the passage okay, where um, uh, that people read and they feel like, hey, uh, only men should do ministry. And especially when it comes to um, the fivefold ministry offices, that passage of Ephesians 4. Okay, verses 8 and 11. Again, this is there in our notes. Uh, this is on page 139. So here it reads this way. He gave gifts unto men. Okay, uh, And then again it says, and he gave some, some. So, you know, gifts unto men. Then it goes on to explain, you know, some uh, pastors, teachers, evangelists, uh, prophets, uh, and um, what's the other one? Apostles. So, Gifts unto men uh, is what brings the contention. However, if you, the, it's in English, in other languages, it, it is translated as men. But if you go back to the original Greek, uh, the word that is used there is anthropos. Okay, anthropos. Now, if we study that word uh, a little more, we would understand that it is a gender neutral word so whenever anthropos is used it could mean a man or it could mean a woman for example you no know, matthew 4 4 is another passage where the same term anthropos is used where it says man shall not live by bread alone but by every word you know that um, uh, every word uh, of god so does it mean that okay man shall not live by bread alone but woman can live by bread alone no because the interpretation there is, it is applicable to both genders. And similarly, no, and again, you can look at several other passages that also use this term anthropos, where it is actually referring to man and woman. So let me uh, let me read another passage, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, where Paul instructs Timothy and says, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men. Who will be able to teach others also? The faithful men over there is Anthropos. So that is gender neutral. Uh, if we want to use a, uh, a Greek word that specifically refers to the male gender, it would be uh, aner. Okay, or I don't know how to pronounce it, but a n e r. Uh, but that's not what is used. You know where uh, these terms men are used in. English. So uh, our understanding is that God has called uh, even women to the work of the ministry in the house of God. So when Paul told Timothy, uh, committed to faithful men, he meant women as well. 
and uh, similarly to the Ephesians when Paul wrote and said that he gave gifts unto men it means that even women can be part of the fivefold ministry offices now when it comes to the the you the the way God empowers uh, you know men and women he didn't make a distinction if we go back to Acts chapter 2 you know there the outpouring of the Holy Spirit even there, it's quite clear. The Holy Spirit poured out on all flesh, uh, your sons and daughters, right? sons and daughters included. So God is pouring out the Spirit and He hasn't limited you know, this gift only to men or uh, you know, some other gifts only to women so on and so forth so we are all both men and women are recipients of the uh, the outpouring of the holy spirit the ministry gifts of god and also uh, through the receiving of this power they can be witnesses for the uh, for the name of jesus and they can go ahead and proclaim about what christ has done so you know uh, women should not be um, uh, we shouldn't be forbidding them from sharing about Christ or moving in the spirit, moving in the gifts of the spirit or even ministering in the local church. So there is no such limitations which we observe. And uh, when it comes to the exercise of ministry gifts, you know, one thing that we see in the ministry of Paul is that you know, Paul encouraged women to be a part of his ministry. Now we're going to look at a couple of other passages that uh, Paul wrote, you know, which again appear like those problem passages that seem to say that women should not be in ministry. However, you know, it's the same Paul who had women in his in his ministry team. So you have an uh, Aquila and his wife Priscilla, okay, who helped him uh, in the teaching of God's word. And you know, there are some commentators who also say that the name of Priscilla is written before Aquila, uh, which uh, means that she was probably a more well-versed teacher as compared to her husband. So, you know, it's it's possible. However, you know, we'll just settle with the fact that she was engaging in teaching of God's word. Uh, so that in itself shows that, hey, uh, a woman was teaching under uh, Paul's leadership. Then there were other women that uh, he wrote about as a Phoebe, in uh, Romans, uh, he, he says she's a deaconess. Okay? So she's one of those uh, leaders, you know, an overseer uh, in capacity over a, uh, a body of believers. Then he praises a woman by the name of Junia, who is known as an outstanding apostle. So there were women in Paul's team. So uh, it's, it's a little contradictory if the same Paul uh, tells women not to preach and teach. Uh, so let's just, um, you know, continue on in our notes. I'll just look at those passages first and then come back to the other sections here. So those problem passages are, one is uh, 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 to 15. A lot of people quote this, uh, where, okay, uh, sorry, let's go back to the other section here, page 140, mm, where, uh, the, the statement is, let your women keep silent. Okay, so this is in First Corinthians chapter 14. He says that, let your women keep silent in the church because it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Okay, so that's what Paul says in First Corinthians 14. And based on this, based on this, a lot of people say, hey, you know, how can a woman preach? How can you let a woman preach? Uh, it's not correct. But uh, if we study this entire passage, as I pointed out earlier, when we talked about order in a church setting, there are three times Paul says, keep silent. Okay, first time he says, keep silent is speak in tongues to the church audience if there is something, um, if there is an interpretation. If there is no interpretation, he says, keep silent. While prophesying, uh, he says, if it is your turn, you prophesy. Otherwise, keep silent. And the third thing is, he says, you know, I, um, a woman should keep silent. I don't, um, and if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husband, husband at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. So that is the third time where he says, you know, women should keep silent. So just going by the context here, Paul is establishing order in the church gathering. Okay. So. We must not have disorder because of speaking in tongues. We must not have disorder because of 
prophesying, we must not have disorder because of women speaking. Okay, so would we tell people to stop speaking in tongues? We would never do that. We, would we tell people to stop prophesying? We would never do that. So why would we tell women to keep silent? You know, just take one, one of the keep silence and use that as, hey, this stands permanently. But you have to look at the context in which Paul was actually saying this. He was saying in the church, you know, it's likely that women were asking questions to their husbands, you know, in the public gathering which he did not want. He said, hey, there's no order in this. So please keep silent, ask the questions at home. Okay. So in that context, uh, Paul said, let your women keep silent. So this is one problem passage that you know a lot of people get stuck on and that is used to tell women uh, not to engage in ministry. Another problem passage here is from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, where you know Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach. Okay, so this is how it, it goes. Uh, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness uh, with self-control. So again, here it, it appears as if he's saying, I do not permit a woman to teach. But going back to the context of the Ephesian church that uh, Timothy was pastoring, you know, there were a lot of cultic teachings uh, uh, in that setting, you know, in, the, in Ephesus. So people who were uh, getting saved out of these, these cults and these practices, once they came into the church, they sort of carried on those same, uh, you know, that, that that same mindset. So apparently, in the in the uh, city of Ephesus, you know, they had they they taught about uh, women being superior to men. Okay, and the women uh, would thus use up power, and they would they would uh, uh, you know sort of treat men poorly. So in that context. Paul is saying that all those cultic teachings, you know, all those practices that, that you are familiar with, you know, I don't want you to teach that. I don't permit a woman to teach. And in the same breath, he says, I'm to have authority over a man. Because you know, that, was the, that was what was going on in the Ephesian context. Okay. Uh, you know, if you uh, continue further, you know, he talks about for Adam was formed first, then he, it sort of makes makes itself clear because now he's talking about God's government in marriage. So in marriage, you know, he says Adam was formed first and then Eve. So that we already agree we've discussed it you know several times over that in the household, in marriage, you know, God has called the man as the spiritual head and, and God has called the man as the leader of the family. So that's how those passages are interpreted, and uh, uh, definitely, you know, they don't mean that a woman cannot teach or uh, preach, and that's not what Paul is talking about because he had women in his team. Okay, so uh, that's about you know women, uh, uh, women being permitted to be in ministry. How about women in leadership? So in the Old Testament, we've already seen people like Deborah; they were in leadership not just doing some work for God, but literally like leadership. Again, uh, in Romans chapter 12, you know, we see that God has given uh, gifts. We call these grace gifts, Romans 12. There are various gifts that are given to people and we're all uh, supposed to use those gifts. You know, if you have prophecy, then you prophesy in proportion to our faith. Ministry, let let us use it uh, in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads. You see, leading is also a grace gift that comes from God. So he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. You know, God does not discriminate. So the, we've already seen you know, this, this, this gifts of the spirit he has given to both genders. Similarly, the grace gifts, we don't see any 
uh, contention about one being able to encourage he who exhorts let him exhort there's no question about oh can a man encourage or should it only be a woman who's encouraging there's no uh, distinction there similarly why should there be a distinction when one is talking about leading so if god um, enables empowers a woman to lead uh, you know a ministry or some something that is calling her to do then why not you know god can grace women as well and even as we look back at history um i don't know if you have read that book uh, god's generals uh, but it it has names of women in it and some of the women uh, are catherine coleman maybe you can just go read up a little bit about them amy semple macpherson uh, who was an evangelist and a founder of the four square church then there is the there is maria woodward and uh, these are all some of the uh, women you know uh, that uh, who who did some wonderful ministry for god and of course in our contemporary in our times now there are other women that we could we can look at and say hey you know god has worked through them god has ministered uh, through their lives so uh women can be in ministry they can also be in leadership uh now when it comes to the government of god which is the family you know it there is again there is no contention on this the scriptures are very clear first corinthians 11 3 it says but i want you to know that the head of every man is christ the head of woman is man and the head of christ is god the head of woman is man so in the context of the family yes okay and again you know this is like we've discussed this in our last uh, uh, discussion like the trinity they are all co-equal but they live in harmony they work in harmony with one another similarly man and woman can be co-equal but they can still play their roles in harmony in um, with you know respect and dignity so that can happen it can very much happen okay mm. all right so uh, some of the practical challenges that happen are you know people read the, these passages again where it says the head of woman is man okay the head of woman is man uh, and they say uh, that uh, if there is a if there is a woman who is a minister of god and there is no man above her let's say she is leading the ministry you know a lot of people would would uh, suggest that she come under the authority of a male minister okay so something you know like a covering or something like a father figure who will who will um, you know, be above the woman with somebody's got some man has to man has got to be above that woman okay so that's that's the understanding however you know we we are quite clear that what paul is writing here to the corinthians it has to do with marriage uh, it does not have to do like you know if uh, there's a woman it doesn't mean that she has to come under you know any man uh and that is that is how god wants it so the women being forced to come under you know if they are single or let's say if they are um they are widowed um, uh them being forced you know uh to to follow and not to lead you know these kind of things have no biblical basis okay um, yeah so i think we have touched on some of the key points uh in in this chapter so if there are any any thoughts comments we can discuss that and then we can move on to the next chapter here okay so i'm looking at our comments here mm, okay say so says the calling of god does not recognize gender but a willing spirit ready to carry out god's assignment to the body of christ um, charles so how do we translate the culture of silence for women how do we explain to lay a uh, person who says women should not preach at moment so uh charles i think i i just talked about that no it's about the interpretation of that statement that paul made over there and uh, we are quite clear that he did not that didn't doesn't mean that women can't minister in that context of the ephesian church he told the women to be silent uh yeah in the ephesian context and also the corinthian context he tells them to be silent so yeah so uh, is that fine charles there's clarity on that okay wonderful yeah 
Great. So what we'll do is, uh, it's 9.50 already. We can take a break. Let's come back. If we have anything to discuss on this subject, we can discuss. And then we can proceed on to our next topic. OK. So uh, OK, everyone, let's go for a break. 10 minutes. We are back at 10 AM. Thank you.